We're so glad you could join us again on our online experience. We are in week three of a new series called New Life, where we're learning about what it means to have new life in Jesus Christ, that the power that, of the resurrection that rose Jesus from the dead is the same power that when we put our faith in Jesus brings us into a new relationship with him. And we are taught, the Apostle Paul said, literally, we are new creations in Christ. And that has a lot of meaning and ramifications for our life. And I, it, it excites me to be able to study and explore that because it does impact every single area of our life, our marriages, our parenting, our dating if you're single, our jobs, our life, our hobbies, all that good stuff. And we've been exploring some different topics last week. Caleb uh, taught a really good sermon on suffering. And if you missed it, I want to encourage you to go back and watch the uh, live stream of that. But today we're going to talk about a different topic that sometimes is challenging for us when we uh, coming into a relationship with Jesus, we understand that he's making us new. He's changing things in our life. We've been set free from our sin. We have a new relationship with him. And then maybe we start to ask the question, what does God want me to do with my life? Or a more theological term would be, what is God's will in my life? And, of course, we pray and we go to the Bible. But then if you've been a Christian for any amount of time, you suddenly discover that you start to find that as you go to Scripture or you pray, uh, you may not get the answers that you're looking for. Maybe you want to get a new job, and you're like, okay, God, what job do you want me to take? And you go to the Bible, and you can't find anywhere in the Bible where it says what job to take. Or maybe you're thinking about your kids. What school do I send my kids to? And you can't find in the Bible where it says, okay, your, your kids should go down to this elementary school and this and that. Also, you may be sitting here, you're, you're dating, and you're like, oh, well, who's going to be my soulmate out there? We're going to talk about that in a minute, why there is no soulmate. But you may think, who am I supposed to date? And you're not really going to find where in the Scripture you're going to go to Acts chapter 2, verse whatever, and it's going to say, hey, Jim, you date Jill. That, that's just not going to be there. And so how do we do that? How do we figure out the will of God? I mean, does God literally give us play-by-play, moment-by-moment instructions in the day, or is it something different? Is it something more? Well, we're going to discover that today. We're going to explore what it means to really understand the will of God in our lives, because yes, God has a plan. God has a will. God has purpose and things that he wants out of you and decisions that, yes, he does want you to make. It just may be that the way we discern that and explore that may be a little bit different than what we're expecting. And so to do that, we're gonna, we've are gonna we been in the book of Romans during this series. Romans is a book written by Paul, the apostle, uh, one of the foundation foundational members of the church. Uh, he had an encounter with Jesus, changed his life. And so we're going to look at a verse that he wrote. Romans chapter 12, we're just going to look at one verse uh, this morning, and it's Romans chapter 12, verse 2, and I'd like to read it to you, and then we'll see what Paul has to say about this idea of understanding and discerning the will of God in our life, because the thing is, we have this new mind, and the new mind it enables us to know God's will. So, Romans chapter 12, we'll look in verse 2. Paul writes, he says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Now what we find in this verse right here, Paul gives us two commands that we are to apply to our life if we are really to discern and discover the will of God. We're going to look at that in a minute. And the first one is this. Uh, you can write it down if you're taking notes somewhere at, while you're watching this, sitting in your bed in your PJs. You can write this down. The first thing that we have to do is we have to break the mold that the world puts us in. And why do I say that? Because Paul in the verses there, he says, hey, don't conform to the pattern of the world. And when that word pattern really means a mold. And so what he's saying there is, we as Christians, as believers in Jesus, there needs to be an element of nonconformity to our lives. Now, I'm not talking about being like lawbreakers or rebellious and all that stuff. I'm saying, no, there has to be a nonconformity where we are different than the world that we live in, different in a good way and a God-honoring way. And so Paul here is saying, don't conform to the world, to the pattern. The world wants to squeeze you into a mold. Now, I guess i got to define what he's talking about where he says world there, because we may read that, and some people can go really far, get really legalistic. They'll sit there and tell you, don't watch movies, don't play cards, don't play Xbox. I would be in a lot of trouble if I didn't play Xbox, especially during this time. But uh, they tell you all things that are just not right. Not, they're legalistic. They're putting rules where God doesn't even put rules. But what's he mean by world? World is the system that we live in 
the world system that is countering against the rule of God in our lives. Chip Ingram and his book R12, he, he really defines it this way. He says the world really runs on three things. He, he calls it the three S's, salary, sex, and status. He says everything can be put into one of those. Salary, of course, the need to accumulate more. Status, we want power, we want prestige. And, of course, uh, we know the world does run on sex because well, we see it in everything. We even sell hamburgers with sex. And he says those three things have a pull on us. And we have a choice as believers to step away from that pool, break that mold, and walk into what is better for us, a better life, the new life that God has called us to. Because you see, the world, and, and, and of course, as I say that, there's lots of good things in our world, but there are things in our world that will constantly pull us back into the old life that we once lived. And so Paul here is saying you've got to break the mold and the hold that the world has got on you. That's, that's what he's talking about in, in, the, in the verses here. You know, when, when I read that, it, it made me think about something. A lot of times people will ask me as a minister, they'll say, well, how far can I go? You know, I understand that there's certain things that I should not do, certain ways of thinking, certain behaviors that I should not step into as a Christian, but, but what's the line? What do you think the line is, Pastor? And here's the thing. I think that's the wrong question. Because if we're asking how close to the line we can get, we're already trying to already negotiate with God what we can and can't do, and that gets us into trouble. Uh, I know, a, I know you, you may be watching this, and maybe you, you watch Netflix, and of course, I, I, with my wife, I watched the documentary, I think a lot of you have watched it, called The Tiger King. And if you've not watched that, uh, parental advisory, probably don't want the kids to watch it, but it is one of those train wrecks of humanity. It's kind of like when you're driving, you don't want to look at the wreck, but the whole time you're doing this, you're like looking. But because it's so captivating, it's a show about these big cat lovers and zoos, and there's murder and mayhem and plots and craziness. It's just crazy, crazy. One thing, I look at that and I'm like, that's definitely behavior that we want to stay away from and ideas and ideals. But here's the thing, in, in that show, and this is a little bit of a spoiler, not a big spoiler, but if you won't mute me for like a second. There's one of the trainers, and she gets too close to a tiger. You know, these are huge, giant, you know, thousand-pound wild cats, and she gets her arm ripped off, rips her arm off. And, and, and to me, that's a lesson. You don't play with tigers because you'll get bit. They're not pets. It's kind of like your house cat. I'm not a cat person. If you are, I love you. God loves you too. But your cat, your cat, if it could be the size of a tiger, it wants to eat you. Just does. It wants to eat you. And so the lesson there is don't play with tigers, you get bit. And, and I look at that when we say things like how close to the edge can I get, it's kind of like we're saying how, how close to the tiger can I get without getting bit. And the problem is when we play with tigers, when we play with the edge, you're going to get bit. And so Paul says, hey, you got to put up barriers, you got to put guardrails, break the mold and walk into a new mold. How do you walk into that new mold? Well, in the verse, he tells us the opposite. He gives us a positive command. He says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And what he's really saying is, okay, in many ways, what happens up here in your head then will filter down and affect what happens here and out there. And so the second thing you've got to do, if you really want to know the will of God in your life, you, you break the mold of the world because that gets in the way, and then you realign your mind to reflect your new life. You see, that, that scripture there, the tense in Greek, it, it's not like a one-time transformation of your mind. This is an ongoing moment-by-moment -moment thing where we participate with God and His Spirit. We're partners in this, where we are being renewed day in, minute by minute, moment by moment. Our mind is being transformed because the goal, of course, is that we become more like Jesus. You know, you, you want to know what God's will is for your life. There, there are scriptures that say that we are to conform to the image of God. We're to be like Jesus. And so Paul here is saying in the verse that you are to be transformed. That transformation starts inside your mind long before it affects behavior. You see, the problem is a lot of times there are people who think that Christianity, our faith, it, that the way we grow in Christ is do better, try harder, and avoid stuff. But that is not the heart of our faith. You can never do enough to be accepted by God. You are accepted by God because of what Jesus has done on your behalf. 
And because of what Jesus has done on your behalf, dying on the cross, raising again on the third day, taking your punishment, changing you from the inside out, then you live out that reality, you partner with God, and God begins to work on you and change you from the inside out. You can never try hard enough. Your, your, your hardest striving and trying will never get you to the point where you grow in Christ. You have to work with, allow the Spirit to change you from the inside out. And that, that's really what Paul is, is talking about here. And, and here's a good way. John Popper has a really great quote on this. He says, The Spirit works from within, and the Word, the Word, the Bible, works from without. Because, you know, you read that and you say, okay, Heath, I get this. I, I need to realign my mind, but how do I do that? Well, it, it begins, okay, it begins by, one, submitting and allowing the Spirit, because we all have the Spirit, we're taught that in Scripture, to guide us, to lead us. Jesus himself said, when the Spirit comes, he'll lead you into truth. And I think the primary way the Spirit does that is he illuminates Scripture. And that's why Popper would say the Word works without. Because the way that my mind is transformed, is changed, is I have a steady diet of the scriptures. I engage with the scriptures. I engage with the word of God. I engage with the gospels. I engage with the letters of the church in the New Testament. I, I engage with the things that have been written to help lead me into truth and help me grow in my relationship. It's just like when you're working out you know, health people always tell you, you know, working out is only 20% of the battle. 80% of it, probably more, is your diet. If you're going to make a physical change, you have to change your diet. If you're going to make a change in your mind, you have to change the diet that your mind consumes. And we do that through a couple of different avenues. We do it through the Word, but we can also do it through relationships with people who are going to encourage us, people who are walking in the same direction we are, people who love Jesus and love us, and they're going to help to spur us on, engage with us, and encourage us. That's why you know, I tell people, even in this time of social distancing, get in a group, get online, and engage in community because that will help to change your mind. It helps you to be fed by other Christians. That's what he's talking about there and then look at what he says here okay we're talking about knowing the will of God and and, and Paul has said you got to do two things break the mold and realign your your mind and then he gives us the benefit of it in this verse he goes on and he says there look what he says he goes on and he says then when these two things have happened in your life and are an ongoing thing that's happening he says, then, then, you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. Right there, people tell me, they're like, I want to know the will of God. So then I have to ask, well, is your mind being changed? Are you, do you have a steady diet of the word, or do you have a steady diet of the world? That's all the difference. Because he says you will be able to test and approve. And, of course, the testing there is you, you begin to have, there, it's, a, it's a word, a theological word. We call it discernment. Discernment is the ability to weigh the course of action that you need to take. Is this decision? Is this behavior? Is this mindset? Is this thinking? Are these words, do they honor God? You test what you're hearing. And then to approve God's will literally means to put into practice what God is telling us. See, the problem is a lot of times people will come and they'll say, well, I think God is telling me to do this. And whatever this is, I'm like, wait a minute, bro. What you're telling me is contrary to what God has revealed in his scripture and God doesn't contradict himself. God's not schizophrenic. And so I, I would say to that, God's probably not speaking to you. Now, but I really feel he is. Well, feelings can really mess us up sometimes. Your feelings should never overrule the fact of Scripture. And, and here's something I want you to get. If this is true, that, that God here is trying to transform us, change our mind, he says there, your mind is renewed, then there is a really powerful thing that we've got to understand, and it's this. God does not tell you what to think, but rather, he tells you how to think. 
You say, wait a minute, dude, uh, you've got a Bible in front of you that's full of all kinds of commands and stuff. What do you mean God's not telling me what to think? I can go find the Ten Commandments. I can go find commands. I can find instructions where, like, there's scriptures in, in the one another's a scripture where I'm told to love my neighbor. I'm told to, to abstain from sexual morality. I'm told to not lie. I'm told to not kill. What do you mean, Heath, that you're saying God's not telling me what to think but how to think? But, but I want you to press down on this. All those commands are principles. Take, for example, the command, God tells us, thou shalt not lie. Okay, I know I'm not to lie, but how do I put that into practice? It's God giving me minute by minute, moment by moment instruction about when not to lie at work, when not to lie in a situation, when not to lie to my kids. How do you put that into practice? That's where discernment comes in. That's where a renewed and transforming mind comes in. See, God is far more interested in your mind learning to think and discern and apply the principles of Scripture than he is in giving you a GPS. It, God, is it, it, the way I look at it, I, I was supposed to take a trip last week to Arizona. This messed it up. Didn't get to go see the Grand Canyon. I looked at the Grand Canyon online. One day I'll get to go out there. But a lot of times we like to think of our spiritual journey as if God is a GPS giving us moment by moment turns. God is like Siri going, turn left now, turn right now. I always put my Siri as a British person. I just think it's cool to do that. But, but it's not, it doesn't work that way, I don't think. And I don't think as you look at Scripture, it works that way in the New Testament. There are, yes, there are times when prophets were spoke directly. And I think God can speak directly to you. I know the plant, this church, that was a direct speaking from God. But oftentimes, day to day, minute by minute, moment by moment, living your life for Jesus, it's more like you've got a map. And you know the direction. You, you know the destination. You're like, I want to go on this map to this mountain. And that mountain will be a command of God. That mountain will be something that is supposed to be reflected in my life. But there's lots of different trails to get there. And God is saying, pick a lane, glorify me in that lane, and follow me. And it, uh, there's a great um, a quote by a guy named Sam Alberry. Uh, he wrote an, an article about this topic, and he said one of the best things. Uh, I want to share it with you. He said, God does not so much want to inform us as to transform us. You see, for a lot of us, our faith, I'm not going to say a lot of us, for some of us, our faith is just seriously, we think if I can get a lot of knowledge, then I'm going to be good to go. But the problem is you can have all the knowledge in the world and still be a jerk. You can have all the Bible knowledge in the world. You can know more than the smartest, most enlightened seminary professor and still not have a relationship with Christ and still not love your neighbor and love God in the way that you should. It's good to have knowledge. It's good to study. That's how your mind's transformed. But the point is, it's not just to get information so you can win Bible trivia. It's so that you change. And, and I, you know, it's hard, I get, it's hard for me. I love the Word. I love to study the Word. But I have to sometimes sit down and ask myself, okay, are you simply looking and digging into this so you'll have something to say on a Sunday morning? Are you applying, internalizing, and allowing this to change you? And that's not always the case. All the time. We're still works in progress. You say, okay, Heath, I get that. God doesn't tell me so much what to think, but how to think. But... What does this really look like in practice? Okay, so I'm going to give you some examples now. So for the single folks out there, this is a big one for you. Big thing that you look for. Big, if you're single, for a lot of you, this is it. We'll say dating, right? I told you earlier when we were talking, God is just not going to pop his head out of the sky and go, hey, go date that person. Some people will say, well, I'm just looking for my soulmate. That is not a scriptural thing. But what God does tell you is he gives you principles in his word. He says things like, do not be unequally yoked with an unbeliever. If you are a Christian, I know some of you are not Christians here, and so I'm going to speak to the Christians right now. If you're a Christian and you're looking for someone to date and you want to know the will of God in your life, God's will is for you to date a believer. And when I say believer, it's not just Billy Joe who says, hey, I'm a Christian, I go to church on Easter and Christmas. He wants you to date someone who loves Jesus. I used to always tell uh, single folks, I'm like, there's two requirements for you dating, Jesus and a job. If they love Jesus and they got a job, you'll probably be okay. 
But the, the thing is, okay, so there, you, you, he's not told you date this person, but you do know one thing that I have to look for, a scriptural principle, is does this person know Jesus? And so you, you look at that. And so, of course, you know, as you think about unleak your yoke, you have to say, is this person going where I'm going? Is this person believe what I believe? Is this person loving Jesus the way I love Jesus? Are we compatible? There's so many things. It's called wisdom and how to apply wisdom. God's not going to peek his head out, like I said, and tell you, but he has given you principles, and how are you applying those principles? Another thing about dating, you know that it's God's will. He says, he literally says in Scripture, this is God's will for you that you will abstain from sexual morality. Now, I know that is not a popular thing to say in our culture. People push back. But if you're going to be a follower of Jesus, you have to take what he says seriously. And so there you know it's his will for you to abstain from sexual morality, but then you say, okay, how do, I, I know that's a principle. So if I'm dating, it means I'm going to abstain from sex before I get married because I want to honor God. And if you're serious about honoring God, you'll say, hey, the, you know, some people say, oh, I need it. It's not a need. You, you, a need is air and water. You're not going to die if you don't have sex. Some of you are like, yeah, I will. No, you won't. But you see, you look at that and you say, okay, that's a principle. Now, how am I going to apply it in my relationships? Moving on from single people. Okay, let's go to some, uh, not just singles, but married people here. Uh, one that we all sometimes struggle with is we, maybe we ask the question of, what job am I going to take? And, you know, I believe that all work, can, that work glorifies God, but there is some work that just by the nature of what that work is, it, it can't glorify God. And so you have to ask yourself, there's lots of questions you ask yourself. You're like, can I use my gifts? Can I use my talents? Can I glorify God in this job? And if you can say yes to that, you're like, well, I've got two choices. God's sitting there going, pick one and glorify me in one of them. And, of course, like I said, there's some jobs I just think you can't glorify God. God in. I've been watching Narcos on Netflix, and I just don't think you can run a drug cartel and be a Sicaro hitman and be like, yeah, man, I'm glorifying God. Probably not, because God said you're not supposed to murder people. And so, you know, it's an extreme thing, but, but you have to ask those questions. How am I applying the principles? Last one, um, in that article by Sam Elberry, he tells a story about a couple that was in his church that they found their dream home across the country and they moved to find their dream home. He said the problem was they were not really seeking the will of God. They were not trying to apply God's principles and were not thinking the way God wanted them to think. He said because the problem is they went out to this place where this dream home was and there was no church for them to attend. There was no body of believers for them to connect with and he said the problem was it was not that they were sent out by the church to go to this unchurched area plant a church start something that's not why they went they went for house and here they've went for a house and they've cut them off self off from community and we know from scripture god desires us to be in christian community and so it, it's a matter of principles and so, you know, as we look at this, you said to me, Heath, I've got some, maybe you're, you've got, you're like, I've got some decisions to make. I'm trying to discern some things. I would say to you, ask this question. Is the choice I'm about to make, will it honor God? If the answer is yes, it will honor God, then go for it. If the answer is no, I don't think this will honor God. I don't think this will honor God in this relationship I'm about to pursue. I don't think it will honor God in this act I'm about to do at work. I don't think it will honor God in this choice I'm about to make. Then by, by all means, if you are a follower of Jesus, put the brakes on and discern in and try to figure out the principle that he's, he's trying to show you. And you may be like, well, I just don't know which way is up. Well, maybe you need to step back and you have to ask yourself, am I conforming more to the world and its values and its pressures than I am to God's values and God's principles? And as you look at that, it's time to make a realignment. And I want to say this as I'm getting ready to close out right now. I know one thing. I can tell you what God's will is for your life. I'm looking in a camera right now and I'm imagining people that I know, my friends that I miss, that like I really wish I could give you a hug. But even those of you that are tuning in, you don't know me and I don't know you. I can tell you this, I know what God's will is for your life. I know God's will for everybody and that is to know him and have a relationship with him. The number one most important decision you can make is to put your faith in Jesus 
and to give your life to him. And I would love for you to make that decision. You see, everything we've talked about today, the new life we're talking about, that can occur. And knowing and discerning God's will and his purpose for you. And next week, we're going to talk about your new identity. That can occur until you have a relationship with him. And so today, as we talk about this, you know, we've got hosts in the lobby, on the online lobby, that would love to help lead you into that. And I'd love for you to go talk to one of them and tell them you're ready to make that decision for Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we've looked at the scripture and we've seen just this one verse, God, packed with so much truth. The Lord, for those of us who are sitting here, maybe sometimes pulling our hair out, saying we want to know what your will is. We want to know what you want us to do. You've just told us, hey, stop conforming to the world and be renewed by what the Spirit and the Word can do in your life. We know, God, that one of the primary ways you talk to us is through your word. You give us those principles to live by that helps change us and helps us learn just to do life. And God, for those of us that struggle and have a hard time with that, we pray you continue that work of changing us. And we understand, God, we don't got to be so hard on us because we're all works in progress. Lord, as uh, we live out our life this week and all the crazy ways we've got to live it in this season, in this moment, May we not forget that you have a will, you have a purpose, and you have a plan for us. And most importantly, that purpose and plan is to have relationship with you. We love you, Jesus. Amen.